So it's a pleasure for me to be here. For those of you who don't know me and weren't here yesterday, just very briefly, I'm, um, I've been a lover of Buddha Dharma since I was about 19 years old. My first, I studied at Naropa Institute when Chogyam Trungpa was still alive in the Vajrayana tradition and then went for a period of, uh, of uh, formlessness, one might say, and then uh, connected to my Zen teacher, Genpo Roshi, in Salt Lake City in about 19, beginning in about 96, and really began studying with him in about 1998, and uh, just about the time that he developed the Big Mind process. So I've been working with the Big Mind process as part of my teaching um, really since, since about 1999. And uh, the other really enormous influence is the work of Ken Wilber. And it was just one of those, I like that I can say the word karmic in this room and not have to explain myself or apologize, <laughs> just a karmic phenomenon that, that uh, at the point that I just really settled into Zen, I wasn't having lineage questions, I wasn't wondering if I should have been a Sufi, you know, I wasn't, you know, trying to somehow integrate my Mormon background, I was 100% Zen. I think that lasted for 24 hours, and then I met Ken Wilber. <laughs> and, but I, I want to tell you a little bit about that to, to set the, uh, the stage, because my work as a professional was as a mediator, and um, I'm a meditator with a lot of meditative training and very little talent, and I'm a mediator with not a lot of mediation training and uh, more talent. So I worked professionally. I was the director of dispute resolution for the Utah court system. And my job was really to promote mediation, to develop mediation programs. I facilitated many, many, many conversations, many negotiations. And I realized at a certain point in my work, and it was about, in to, about 2003, that we were operating with a, with a very naive assumption. And the assumption that we operated with in the mediation community was that perspective taking was natural and that everybody could do it, that we could change perspectives. And I realized that as a mediator that actually that wasn't true. I went into mediations in which some people actually had a difficult time taking their own perspective. And, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but then when you think for a minute about people who have abuse histories or people who live in cultures, if you're a young person, you're not really allowed to give your opinion, that it became very obvious to me that some people literally couldn't take their own point of view. And for me to ask them what they wanted or what they thought was in a way to, <clears throat> was to presume something that simply wasn't the case. Then you would have people who could take their own point of view but couldn't take the point of view of the other. Most of you in this room fall into that category. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but we all know what that's like, right? To be really in our own perspective and to not be able to somehow take the perspective of our spouse or of our girlfriend or of our mother, whatever it is, or whoever it happens to be. We have moments where we get very fixed and very attached to our way of seeing things. It becomes difficult to, to hear the other. We all know that experience. And then I would find that there were people who could take their own point of view. They could take the point of view of the other. They could take the point of view of a judge or of an attorney. They could take the point of view of the past and the future. And there were other people who could take a point of view on the process itself. So they were like magic, those people. And the interesting thing about those people is they were the easiest to work with and they also tended to give away the most. And so I'd, I would get concerned that in a certain way, actually being able to take a perspective disadvantaged you when it came to a negotiation because you wouldn't necessarily hold on to your point of view. And there was much more flexibility and willingness to give and take because they could see it from so many different points of view and value wasn't fixed in the same way their point of view wasn't fixed. So I, got, I suddenly started to see that perspective taking was developmental. And for whatever reason, I spontaneously started to think about developmental models that I'd been exposed to. And I thought about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, her stages of grief. Everybody familiar? Her stages of grief, beginning with denial, moving to anger, bargaining. That there, there were stages to that. And I started to see that as, as, as negotiators, that people had more or less capacity based on something that was a little bit mysterious to me. 
And it was right after that that I was introduced to Ken Wilber's work. I met him in 2004. And for those of you, how many of you know integral theory and are, are relatively familiar with, with Ken? So it looks like about 50%. And um, my connection to Vince and to the uh, other people here at, at Buddhist Geeks is through the integral world. And so what happened as I was introduced to Ken and to the Integral Institute and I started to work for them is I started to see that Ken's way of working with the world and working with theory, that he had certain critiques of the spiritual, spiritual traditions as they exist now. And one of his critiques was that they tended to, and all the, the five great traditions emerged in human consciousness from about three to 5,000 years ago, and he placed the traditions in an evolutionary spectrum, not just in terms of culture, but in terms of the entire spectrum of uh, human beings. And, and so all of a sudden, the traditions were located across time. So the evolutionary point of view became very important. He also um, talked about development in terms of culture and how not only do we develop as individuals, that we the culture itself is develop, developing. Each religion has a fundamentalist perspective, right? Each religion has a rational scientific dimension. Each religion, religion has a, a pluralistic. And so that I started to see things in a much broader perspective re, related to this issue of development. So this perspective-taking issue led me to Ken's work, and I started to see that, oh, an evolutionary spirituality to add that dimension into how we understand things started to become very important to me. And he has a, a set of things that he thinks we need to start to consider as people practicing uh, spirituality in our time, including science, including um, uh, cultural studies, uh, communication theory, uh, being really clear about what the mystical experience is, not shying away from that, not being afraid to use the word enlightenment. There's a whole set of things. So what I thought might be important today was to introduce you a little bit to a, a developmental point of view in our discussion of practice and also to look at what we're referring to sometimes reluctantly as the enlightened experience uh, from, from opening a different gateway into that experience. Does that make sense to you? And we said we had a little more time, so I just want to make sure that I don't run over, because this is going to take a few minutes. So if somebody could just tell me when uh, my hard stop is based on that we started early, that would be great. Okay. So I'm going to ask to speak to some voices, and we're going to take a journey, and I'm going to use the big mind process. So I'm going to ask you to identify as this voice. We'll explore it for you know, three or four minutes, and then we're going to move from that voice to the next one. And we're basically going to arrive in a place that I think you'll recognize, and I'll ask you a few questions just to test it and see if we know where we are. So I'm sure you don't know anything about what I'm asking you to do, but nonetheless. So the voice I'd like you to identify with is the voice of the egocentric self. So just identify as the egocentric self, and let's see who you are. So who am I speaking to? Okay, the egocentric self. So you can raise your hands. Just tell me about you. Tell me what you notice, who you are, what your identity is, what you're concerned with. What are you concerned with? Yes. Man, I'm great. Okay, good. I'm great. And I'm concerned with myself. Yes. Okay, so as the egocentric self, I'm right and you're not. Good. What else? Yes. So in one moment, I'm, I feel right and very confident, but in the next moment, I'm confused. So I, I change. How many of you, as, as the egocentric self, do you change and do you feel a little unstable? Okay. Sometimes you feel great. Sometimes you feel diminished. Okay, good. What else do you notice? Yeah. A lot of opinions. Oh, my God. I'm not going to, you know that, the, have you ever heard that? I'm not going to say. We'll, I'll tell you afterwards. It's, <laughs> it's kind of crude, but it has to do with opinions and body parts. So anyway, yeah, go ahead, please. Having many opinions and many preferences, please. In that vein, I think we should switch places. Okay, very good. I think we should switch. Excellent. What else? Please. Okay, I t I, I'm absorbed with myself, and we, we explored this yesterday a little bit, and one of the things that's important to me as a teacher is that I work really hard, particularly based on this notion of human development and developmental theory, not to make the egoic experience a bad one. 
Okay, this is, a, this is one of the things that I think we can outgrow, is that uh, the ego is bad and wrong. The ego is, suffers. That's a very different thing. The ego suffers, but from a developmental perspective, and the reason we should consider development as part of our spiritual practice, is that ego development, developing an ego is absolutely not only natural, but necessary. Okay, and then within that egoic experience, we can have what we call a healthy or an unhealthy ego, but it's a localized experience. There tends to be a lot of stress, a lot of emphasis on, on um, survival, on accomplishment, on uh, being seen, just all the things that the self is concerned with. So the self isn't bad, the self is simply limited and tends to suffer. Is that fair? Are you with me? Okay, it changes it a little bit. So I'd like us to grow in our identity right now. I'd like to ask you now to identify as the ethnocentric self. The ethnocentric self. You just got bigger in your identification. So who am I speaking to? The ethnocentric self. Now, spiritual seekers tend to disown this voice. Okay? So I'm going to have to probably work with you to help you find it. So as the ethnocentric self, who are you? Uh, sure, but my group is, right? So I just grew. I'm not just concerned with myself. I'm now concerned with my group, my family, my nation, the people I belong to, the people I feel at home with. Do you know who you are? Okay, yeah, please. You're either in my group or you're out. Okay, so you're in my group or you're out. When George Bush said you're either for us or against us, that was an expression of this mind, of this identification. And we all know it and we all have it, but we tend to disidentify with it. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So tell me more about you. Try to find this voice. And to, Yes. I'm very loyal. So there's a set of virtues to this identity and a set of values. I'm very loyal. Please. Okay, so if you want to come into my group, I'd love to have you on what conditions? What are the conditions of belonging? You've got to be one of us. You know, there's a very strong boundary around who we are, and you're welcome to belong if you subscribe to our conventions, our way of dressing, our way of speaking. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a very strong boundary, and it offers a lot of protection and a lot of belonging. Right? But it's not easy to move in and out. Please. You protect my back, I'll protect yours. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll notice at the ethnocentric level of development, I'm actually willing to sacrifice my life, which at egocentric I wasn't willing to do for my clan or my group. Does that make sense? So just take a moment. Yeah, please. Go ahead. If you want to get enlightened, follow my rules. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, very good. Now, <clears throat> can you feel the protection of belonging at this level? Okay. Now, if I were to ask you to experience yourself as Buddhist at the ethnocentric level, just tell me a little bit about what that experience is. <clears throat> Absolutely. <laughs> and, we, and we know the truth and we don't have to speak it. <laughs> Why would you want to add anything to your experience? <laughs> Our spines tend to be the straightest. What else? From this, just from this level of development. And we, again, we all have this, right? So, so what else? As a Buddhist, from an ethnocentric perspective, what else would you say? We know about suffering, absolutely. We know about suffering. What else? We have the validation of antiquity. We have the validation of antiquity. And, our, and we're also, you know, Buddhist, Buddhism is very interesting. It moves from culture to culture pretty easily. You know, kind of hip, glasses, you know. Hey. <laughs> Please. Buddhist geeks, you know. We're the best. <laughs> Please. It's better than science. Yeah, yeah. Are you kidding? Like, we were onto this long before the scientists were. <laughs> like, they're telling us what we already know. Mindfulness helps. Hello. Right. <laughs> you don't have to cut my brain and have to tell me that. 
Okay, you, you get it, right? This is what I'm talking about. Okay, very good. You all know who you are. All right, here we go. So, I'd like to, us to grow a little bit, I think. Part of the reason that we disidentify with this is this is dangerous. The egocentric self suffers. The eth ethnocentric self goes to war. It's much, more, it's much more dangerous for human beings to identify with this, which is why we disown it. Does that make sense? I mean, every, every battle on the planet now that has to do with religious strife, with ethnic strife, with you know, an ism that's at war, has to do with this particular where dogma becomes a platform for actually waging war. So we're scared of this energy, and we should be. It's something that we actually, the reason I like to ask people to work with it and to learn about it is because you can work with people if you know this energy. If you really are willing to find it in yourself, you can be much more successful in the work you do, particularly if you're in peacemaking. Okay? It's really important to know what it is. Okay, ready to grow? We're ready to get out of here because it's dangerous to be here, right? Okay, let me speak to the world-centric self, please. The world-centric self. So who am I speaking to? World-centric self. So tell me about you. Who are you? What happened? Yeah. You do what? <laughs> I drive a Prius. <laughs> you can hear a little, there's a little ethnocentrism in that. <laughs> you know. I drive a Prius. But, but again, so we'll notice that this sense of identity at world, that actually it's, it's there at world centric too, like I actually care for the planet, unlike you people who are ravaging it and driving those SUVs. So we still feel, that, you know, I just grew, I became a member of humanity, I, I, I'm now open to the Muslims, and I'm open to the Jews, and I read Kabbalah, and I care about Christian mystics, I've, I'm open, but I still scowl just a little bit at the ethnocentric people. Does that make sense? You're not quite as big as I am. Go ahead, please. Absolutely, we're all connected, and your suffering is my suffering. Beautiful. So I saw a hand over here, I think. Yeah. Similar to hers, there's so much suffering and so much harmony. Yeah, so all of a sudden, at this level, I really feel like I belong. And I also feel that the pain of the world is mine. And it's, it's extreme, right? I mean, it's one thing when I'm just dealing with myself and the suffering. It's another thing when I'm dealing with the suffering of my group and trying to work through the legacy of my, my people. But it's a whole other thing when I realize, oh my God, the suffering of the planet is enormous. And I experience it and I feel it. You know, when there's, a, when there's an earthquake, you know, in Haiti, or when there's a, a, this nuclear disaster in Japan, I'm affected by it, I care about it. What else comes into focus at this level? What else do you notice that becomes important, please? Yeah, yeah. Like the national boundaries dissolve. I start to see the beauty of the ecosystems. S you know, caring about the species and the planet comes online. And, and this is, thank you, and this is, um, so this is this world-centric experience. All of a sudden, we see a global community. We see, see technology. Rather being, than being threatened by difference, which at the ethnocentric level, we're threatened. Rather than being threatened by difference, we're interested in it. Like, I want to learn to speak your language. I want to dress like you do. How many of you have, have practiced in more than one spiritual tradition? You've d d of course, shamanic practice, Buddhist practice. I mean, this gets a little sloppy sometimes, you know, trying to keep people in a container, you know. So, so as the world, like, again, my awareness just expanded. My values changed. The planet becomes important. Sustainability is an issue for me. Human rights. And what you see in culture is the world-centric level of development emerged in human culture at the time of the Enlightenment in Europe, but really came on to, when, with the birth of the United Nations, the women's movement, um, gay rights, like all these things are, are basically flowering of this level of development. Does that make sense to you all? Are you with me? Is this a new idea for you? Not necessarily. Okay, please. I'm unfocused. I'm unfocused. Okay. It's just too big. Okay. Well, it's just about to get bigger. Yeah, go ahead. I'm afraid for us. Yeah, I'm afraid for, I'm afraid for us. Absolutely. All six, now seven billion of us. I'm afraid for us. And I see the stresses of, of what's happening, and it's scary. 
All right, let's go one more level, and I'm going to try to get you to this place in, in uh, about the three, four minutes that I have left. So I'd like to speak to the cosmic centric self, the cosmic centric self. So who am I speaking to? The cosmic centric self. Okay, good. Tell me about you. Yeah, I'm vast. Very good. Everything sucks, but it's okay. <laughs> Everything sucks, but it's okay. That's a modern day roomy line. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly the mystic poets, you know. The um, jazz music, this, uh, musician, Wynton Marsalis, he said, jazz taught me that everything is fucked up and everything is cool. <laughs> okay, good. So we see the cosmic-centric level suddenly paradoxes my reality. The either-or, self-other, at egocentric, us-them, at ethnocentric, you know, are we going to be okay or not, at world-centric, suddenly at cosmic-centric, it's all one. It's the same, right? Good. Somebody's hand was up over here, please. All right, so suddenly my whole experience of time and space just shifted. What happened to the urgency that I felt at World Centric? It's just not there. What happened to the fear for human beings? It's gone. What? Everything is fine. And it includes all the change. It includes the stresses. It includes the fact that we die and we pass. Right? But just that shift, and all of a sudden, reality is a completely different experience. Please. Absolutely. So suddenly, also just notice, very subtle but powerful, I notice my heart came online. You just said, I use the word, I'm enamored. Suddenly there's this sense of, wow, I actually love this experience. You know, this experience means something to me. There's a beauty that starts to emerge with this level of consciousness, right? So what does the bodhisattva vow mean from here? In other words, you know the bodhisattva vow, right? That basically that I am going to, in some way, not reside exclusively in this place of peace and nirvana so that I can what? I can what? A absolutely. So I can be available to the world-centric domain. I can be available to my family and the ethnocentric. And I can continue to work with my own consciousness, love myself, be available. So as a bodhisattva, I engage all of that, right? It is me, and I love it, and I'm willing to work with it. And can you see the difference between working on humanitarian issues, social justice, the environment from a cosmic-centric level versus a world-centric? Do you see the difference? Like your compassion is large enough to actually handle what you're doing because it's not yours. Okay? You with me? All right, good. I think that's a great place to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.